We first heard about it from a guy called Fritz Perls. He taught Gestalt therapy. And he made the point that usually you're not really there. Your, your mind is elsewhere. You're kind of feeding a little bit to your mind because you're thinking about what you're going to do over there. And he was able to go in there into your mind and bring you back to him. And he, would, he would look and say, what are you looking up here for? Come back here to me. <laughs> but this culture doesn't have any place for mobile people in their social myth. It's seen more as a vagrancy, it's more of a, a degraded experience. It's only something the poor would choose, not the, not the adventurers. We're not considering the genre of the human spirit that chooses to step out and be a bold person. Uh, when I first went to San Francisco, it was because I'd read On the Road, like everybody. And On the Road opened up America to uh, people in a way that it had never been before. And uh, it was never been the same since. That the car was more than just the family uh, flivvy that went off to, to see Grandma. That it was an extension of our personalities and our uh, aptitude, our dreams. Pioneers cross this country in wagon trains. Uh, this is like an extension of that wagon train. You know, it's still it's still pioneering. You know, it's still the adventure. It's still crossing land that you've never crossed before. We're, we are mobile beings. We were meant to move. This is a different escape for people, you know, a bus, uh, it's like, you know, it's sort of like the turtle, you know, you got your home on your back, you can go anywhere you like, uh, wherever you go, your home, you know, you set up camp and there you are. You know, I've lived without running water and or electricity, except for my 12 volt batteries, and grab my gravity flow water system for over 15 years I've lived like this, completely unplugged, I've got, I got an acoustic lifestyle. Keep it simple. The truth? Well, or whatever you want. The truth, of, my name is Michael Payne. I'm 45. I was born in Missouri. I've been out here since 72. Here, Oregon, and Arizona. Out here, everybody knows me on the streets is easy. I'm easy to get along with. And then my nickname just kind of st stiff. It's stiff. So I've had it for about 10 years now. What's up, Wood? How about me? I'm an aging deadhead. I was on tour for like 12 years, off and on. I traveled all over the country following the guys, east coast, west coast. I had a blast. And I liked the lifestyle so much, I ain't going to never go back. I mean, this, like I said, it's, my, it's not much, it's my home. I do a lot of collecting. I like, uh, I forget who it was, but somebody was calling it al alternative lifestyles. They teach uh, garbology 101 and shit like that. I could be a professor of that, that one, because that's what I do. So I go dumpster diving a lot. Man across the street there, Bull, he's, he's a brother. I've known him for over 20 years, like 25 years. I've known his mother longer than that. Hey, Bull. And we're about as close as two brothers could be. Hi, my name is Bruce Austin. Most people call me Bull. Um, right now I'm in Santa Barbara. I was born and raised in Wisconsin. And this is my home. Welcome to it. Let me see. Yeah, right here in this area here will be the sink. 
and then refrigerator is right here, then I'll have the stove here. And then this area right here will be my shower and commode. And then emergency door or back door if you want to call it that. Closet. Back here I'll have two little single beds or maybe double, well two beds period for a room. And then I'll have the master bedroom which would be mine back here. Well in the mornings I usually work on the bus maybe sometimes in the afternoons. Uh, and in most afternoons, we just relax and then play dominoes. You know, we get a little get together before it gets too dark. And we, you know, that way we don't have to waste our batteries at night. There's nothing I'm going to do yet. Running out of town. I like edge weapons. I used to be a member of the SCA, Society for Creative Anachronisms. And I got kind of, kind of got used to having things like this hanging around. I like, to, I like blades. Yeah. Any kind of blade. Yeah. I've got boxes and boxes of pocket knives and shit like that around it. They're broken. I still keep them because I take them apart and make other ones out. That and wandering around in the middle of the night. I don't sleep good at night. Sorry, because you know I use every once in a while I use Easy's uh, facilities. Since I don't have one in my bus yet. Uh huh. Now run that, run that by me again. Well, right now there's four of us. There's me, Woody, Easy, and Buck. And a lot of times, you know, you get bored just sitting around doing nothing or watching TV. And uh, you know, sometimes we might go do something like read a book or something like that. But most of the time we play dominoes. We play like five, ten thousand points sometimes. We play what, five hours straight at one point? Yeah. And on this game, it's a, that's a lot of dominoes. Oh, yeah. <coughs> yeah, might as well make a 35 hole cover up the back door. Might as well. You know, these are our homes. We don't use them as recreational vehicles. We use them as our main house. Our house has wheels on it. Or some just have a cement foundation. Oh, they're a threat. They've, the gypsies have always been a threat. It's always been a frightening thing to communities to have people flowing by. Um, you guys need to see some uh, Cassidy footage. He was the best. I just came up with a name for Neil Cassidy. He was saying a very important thing to uh, a generation of people. It takes a long time to get it, and it can only be really said as you're driving and, or riding in a car, because the commentary and the movement of the car and the shifting of the gears and the hitting of the brakes and the swerving and the talking uh, becomes punctuation. This is the captain speaking. He says, you always got to be following that edge. He says, you have to be... If you're not wheeling and you're not squealing, you ain't really driving. A lot of people do it and do it well, but he was the first to ever do it like that. He was Woody Guthrie uh, behind the wheel telling the stories of America. This is what it's all about right here, being able to drive your house away. <laughs> My mom always asked me, you know, well, what are you gonna do with your life? I how are you going to have the things that you want? Well, I have the things that I want now, you know. Hi. <laughs> I'm Stephanie. It's my girlfriend. Hi. <laughs> We've been together for a year and eight months. Mm -hmm. well, she's going to come travel with me this summer. Well, I've never really been on the road like he has, so I worry about not having any money or breaking down or just but this summer I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. It'll be fun. Me and Dave just wanna go like get some property and live in this while we build our own house. Cause somewhere I just I haven't found where I wanna live. My shower stop. I wanna travel around so I oh, can sorry. figure it out. Alright I'll see you in a while. I 
I'd provide her with peace and serenity for sure, you know. I'm sure that they're worried about their daughter and, and like, you know, if she wants to stay with me, what kind of life I would provide for her and all that. Any parent's worries, you know, are, they're all pliable. I, I don't worry about things like that because I know that it, it works out. I often think of uh, that bus as like a gypsy wagon. When it shows up, you, it's the calling card. It, uh, everything is there on the plate and obvious for anybody who wants to see it. So Cassidy pushed it to the limit all the time. When he got behind a wheel, it was kind of a poem. And he could write and uh, he could talk, but when he was behind the wheel and moving down the road with about five scared teenagers in the car with him, it all became an extension of his uh, art and his will. And it was him that drew a lot of us into it. And that, uh, that's a wonderful thing to have a guru like that who teaches you about life. Here I now sit in past dreams realized, and the thoughts I now think blossom into tomorrow's realities. And what, what name do you go by? Mother Frog or Blow Fro sometimes. I Froggy Eye if you're Rasta. Frogananda if you're East Indian. Bro uh, Fro if you're black. Froggy if you're a girl. <laughs> it's not neat. I don't want you photographing all this. I don't even have it the way I want it. How do you want it? Well, I want it neat. You guys came in here, you know, I'm not ready for to show my vehicle up. My being is my home, you know, the way I uh, conduct life. Sometimes a single note, sometimes a symphony. So let's see. Uh, we, we go out on an adventure every day. We start out with my dog, you know, and we go out on an adventure and we come to the ocean. We come and walk on the beach, jog along, keep us warm, warms us up, we jog along. And then we'll sit like a Buddha in the sand dunes and see if there's any messages on our, get any email through the cosmic messenger service, you know, coming across the ocean and, uh, uh, and that'll tell us what to do. You know, the great spirit will speak to us and then uh, we might have to write on my van or go save a whale or something like that. It's a price to freedom though. You know, you don't get Christmas, you don't get Thanksgiving, and all the things that go with family. But what you do get is every other day of the year. And what do those days offer you? Well, they, they offer you whatever creative possibilities you can have through your interchanges with either people or life. Well, you see, my lifestyle is going with the flow. I think. So as it flows, I, I could handle it either way. You know, if I get rich, fine. You know, if I don't get rich, that's okay. I'll, I'll do good this way. I don't expect to, and I expect to be happy anyway. From hindsight, you think you should have made this move or that. You know, like Bob Dylan said, I once had a mountain in the palm of my hand, the rivers that ran through every day. I must have been mad, Lord. I didn't know what I had, Lord. I threw it all away. <laughs> uh, Frederick, this is the captain speaking. Are you still there? Are you? Oh, are you? Are you? I feel sure that he will be okay. I'm leaving it up to you, Peters, to handle the exit room. All I have to do is just keep moving north t towards where I want to settle, and it it'll all happen for me. I'm positive. I don't worry about it like other people worry about the future, you know, because it's going to be the same. I'm just going to be older. And then Lon Scott. Lon, Lon Scott? Yeah, Lon Scott. And what do people know you as? Uh, I adopted the name Cosmo because I like to wear a song. I'm about 73.
72, something like that, I don't know, 70s. Mm. Where did you grow up? Kansas City, Missouri. And, and, and how long did you live, live, live there for? All my young life. How, how old were you when you left home? I don't know, 15, 16. Maybe 17, I don't know. You started traveling? Yeah. People pissed me off. Who? My folks did. They didn't have no understanding. What's Couldn't you? understand shit. So I left. I was a beatnik for a long time. Uh, expounding a whole lot of, against doing anything resourceful or uh, worth anything. I was a lazy motherfucker. <laughs> I didn't do nothing. Just stay loaded, which wasn't no good. There's more to life than that. Yeah, I like living in vehicle in summertime, but not in weather like this, though. Not when it rains, this thing leaks. And it kind of messed with my arthritis. Reading on parks on this tree, I had to figure out how to park on this tree to keep it from raining steadily on my roof, because it rains steadily on the roof. It's just like I got a sprinkler system going in here. Uh, I had to... I had to figure out the right tree to park on it. This is it, the one I'm parked on. It covered the whole roof. Oh yeah, I live in houses. Just cause, you know, security houses and all that shit. I guess that's a kind of nice way to live. I mean, everybody else do. It just looked like it would, it would, it would make me older before my time. You know, you can't live a lifestyle like this halfway either. Else you. Just be sitting out here half starved. Mad at the world. When you're supposed to be out here trying to get your head together, you're out here mad about something. That ain't no lifestyle. Brother. Lifestyle I live, I think it's pretty good. Just another shitty day in paradise. Here comes Carver. Here comes that fucking Carver. Carver! What's up? What's up, I see man? You got your starter, dude. Huh? I see you got your starter. Yeah. Right on, man. I told him I'd come help give a hand, yeah. put it in if you come want. On, come on, come on. Come oh, on. yeah. Yeah. So, so how long have you two known each other? 20 something years. Yeah. yeah. About, about that. Yeah. All the way from Venice, California. To Except I help raise your sister. He's your little brother. Right there. No, he, oh, right up door, on yeah. the dash. Yeah, that's my sister up on the dash. Ah. They used to party out down in Venice a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've been living in mine for... Living in vehicles for... Ever since I got out of the service in 1973. <laughs> Came home from Vietnam and nobody acted right, so I just... I split. Society didn't want to mess with me, you know, they were, they, I was more or less outcast, so I went to Canada for about eight years and uh, lived out in the bush country logging and picking rock and root in fields, I mean, just staying more or less away from people. It's not that I have anything against people. Uh, they didn't have no respect for me, so I guess I lost my respect for most people in, in that sense. I, they didn't want to associate with me, so... Yeah. I just decided to go out and associate with the people who was out, not associating with everybody else. Where you old lady at? She down there at the, uh, at the van with the puppies and stuff. Uh, we just picked up a fella named uh, Utopia. Man, he walked from Tijuana to San Francisco for uh, veterans' rights. Utopia, I know him. He, he, he tried to play drums. I've been looking all over for you, and these cats had you all along. No, they didn't even... I didn't know you was back yet. I just was talking to her about your dad, sitting there going, man, I got his gloves. They kidnapped me down on Burton. I was heading over to brother's place. 
Everybody along this coast knows she's Topia. Because I don't use the name Arthur James McFadden III anymore. Plus, I'm probably the only African American that's got walking papers by the police department. I got my passport saying, don't fuck with me. I'm not the one. You, you'd rather kiss a rattlesnake in the phone booth than mess with me. This guy, Utopia, <clears throat> that was here earlier. I know, we just picked him up, man. He was walking Cambridge. down the road, and I pulled over in my car. This is months and months ago. He's walking down the road the other way, and I said, that guy's on a mission. I didn't think about doing the walk or nothing like that. I was pulled and compelled. I tried to walk away. I had an energy pulling on me. I, could, I was like, what? What? You know, it was pulling on me. I couldn't explain it. Well, he was carrying bongos down the road, and he was on his way to San Francisco to get this proclamation for a, you know, just everybody just get along. It's the unity thing. I had no idea that the mayor of uh, San Francisco was going to issue out a proclamation for me for doing the wall. Yeah. He comes back with his proclam proclamation from San Francisco saying that from now until hell won't have it, they're going to have a unity march day. What's so wrong with the concept of unity? Everybody eating, everybody living, everybody having fun, raising children, being productive. We're not productive anymore. Just the freedom to change your scenery like the channel on the television and experience the motion that, oh, look at you give me, oh, experience, experience the beauty, the sounds, the smell, the taste, the feel. Freedom and the energy that it provides. That, that's what, what I really mean to say is freedom, and it's, it, it's freedom fixes most anything. Everybody experiences it now and then. When, uh, something will bring you into that pinnacle of, uh, of beingness that can only be explained by being there. Sometimes it took shaking you loose from your usual uh, work a day, let's go to uh, the store, daddy, kind of life. And all of our the bus and the acid taking and all of our experiments with lifestyles were built around that. There was nothing really else to achieve except to be present and be involved with, uh, with life. Think about it, do you mind for it? Because see, the only problems we have are the ones we create. The only ones we have are the ones we create. They call me carver, because I'm always carving things out of stone, bone, ivory, metal, uh, seashells, uh, whatever I get my hands on, it doesn't matter. This is my wife of last July 4th. Most guys get married and it's like, you know, they say they got the ball and chain. I married a lady that likes what I do and she likes living with me like the way I live. So that's independence, man, because I she don't expect nothing more of me than what I, what I can do. And what I can do is I can survive, I can feed us, I can take and pick up an object off the side of the road and make a piece of art out of it. About the last eight years or so, I've been on Social Security for a while because I was sick. What was it? Cancer. Um, got in a real bad accident. Lost use of my legs and uh, my right hand. I had radial nerve damage from up in my neck down my right side still. But see, they told me I wasn't doing a walk. So I started walking and rolling logs around and building shit. And they were going, you know, you can't do that. I'll show you tomorrow. I can do that, and I'd do it. People kind of expect when they go down the beach to see a carver built home. That's what this is. It's an art form that you can't really take and display in a gallery, in a sense. It's just, it's because the material's here, and it was something to do, and I'd seen somebody had tried to make a little beach head or a windbreak on the beach one day, and so I went up and I found some interlocking pieces, and 
made this great big, a big house. How many of these have you built up and down the coast? 30 or 40. <laughs> Through the years, I just stop and walk down to the beach and I look for driftwood. I just believe there's a greater power of some sort. And, uh, and he appreciates things like this. I think it's just kind of following the nomadic tradition of people in general. I mean, it's just we've run out of we've run out of more or less frontiers of a sort. And out here on the coast, there's enough sparse, sparsely populated areas you can kind of change my whole yard. Changing your yard changes your whole outlook. I believe everybody's got a place to be somewhere, sometime. They've got an action or a word. It could be some minor anything. They've got somewhere to be to cause something, a thought, an idea, an, uh, their action causing a reaction that causes a whole change in the world. You never know. But a simple idea, like your idea of doing this, going out and uh, checking out the people that are just passing through, you know. It's, that's what life is anyway, you're just passing through, you're just a, a short time in the spectrum of Every moment's a gift. the big long thing. <laughs> we all did something to warn each other's presence right at this moment. We all did something right. I'm so glad that I walked at the right time because I was walking. I was right. <laughs> oh, let me stop. Okay, okay, okay. The here right now. The here. This is the now. You can take a road that's going out this way, that way, all from that, around, getting closer to now, or either the opposite way, but it also comes to now. You have the power to change. We used to do, do everything that we could to try to bring people into the now by, by tossing balls to people, by, uh, uh, it's like the, the Zen koans that would ask questions and then give answers that didn't make any sense, but the relation between the asker and the answer uh, was what was important. The be here now thing that Dick Alpert picked up on and was us trying to reclaim life that had been taken away from us by people who wanted us to be there tomorrow or be there yesterday. But when you're, when you're in the present, uh, completely in the present, you are almost in a state of grace. In fact, most people that are in a state of grace, they never realize they are because, uh, because they're in grace. Grace doesn't turn and look on itself. Grace, grace just exists. Grace happens like shit. Hello, hello, hello. Can you hear me now? Does it sound like you can hear me? What's going on? Is it the acoustics? The shitty acoustics. Something about the, uh, if I speak louder, is this cool or how loud should I talk? Okay, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Does it, does it affect it to from move around or? Yes, I'm Theodore Henshaw, and um, I'm here today with, with these really genuine, very cool people. And freedom, my friend, that I found. That's good, too. <laughs> yeah. 
This is my home. This is where I stayed for two and a half years, pretty much, to escape the hospitals. At first, it was a lot of fun. It was, it was, it was tough and, and things like that. But um, the whole idea of just parking it and um, being in the middle of nowhere, sometimes in in the city streets or whatnot, and having cars go by and people, it's, it's just that's a struggle. You know, I'd rather live life. I'd rather just enjoy and have fun and 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 really really get well and stuff like that. But getting well, I've always since I'm 17, I've always had to get well, and I feel like I'm well. You know, I'm well, and 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 then. What, what happened when you were 17? That's, That's when the, the mental health cycle started, you know. You know. Um, the medications were really frightful. They had me on um, beds and straps and, and thors and stuff. And I was grouped with drug, you know, drug addicts and things like that. And I hadn't been on drugs. And um, I was grouped with people that were violent and, and things. And that was really scary. What did they institute for? Um, a lot of it, um, good questions. Not too much have I done, really. Um, I I was having delusions. I was feeling like um, paranoia from TV and things like that. And I saw visions. Um, visions I don't understand. Spheres floating and um, mechanical, mechanical. They seem like the, f the future, and they. I, I don't. I don't know. I don't know where they come from. I feel they're. You see actual clear visions in, in your mind? Yeah, very clear, very clear. I asked about, like, um, I was very scared of 666, you know, the mark, the mark of what they said, you know, the mark of the beast or whatever. So I was really afraid of that. I asked for visions. God, what is it about? And I saw, I saw just worlds that just awed me. I was just in awe of them. I wish I could take it out and show you guys, because then you'd be all up. But we just explain it, and I feel like a <laughs> I mean, I feel like this mental guy. To me, this is a classic example of the difference between clinic and community. What he's really wanting is community. Healers, friends, people that love him and care around him. He'll be healed. There's nothing unhealed about this person. There's only fear. I want somebody that, that will will help me relate and, and figure out what the visions I'm seeing seeing are. You know, it's like, you know, I, I like the powers. I, um, I I like the powers that that are there to, to see these worlds or whatever. And I don't know who, who to trust with them, really. Like, if you go to a hospital and you tell them, well, I'm seeing these visions about whatever, or the delusions and they'll medicate you and the medications to me, I'm, just been nightmares. I mean, they've been just total nightmares. And for me to tell them I don't want to take these things has been impossible. So how did you get out of the institution? Oh, it's such a harsh battle. Um, I just, I kind of had to play with the rules a lot. And I'm still really terrified of them because, I mean, they really, they really have me. I mean, I'm, I've been through so many. Um, but just go through the rules and, and just uh, try to do the best I can with uh, my sanity. What Cassidy used to always say, you have to keep correcting yourself all the time, but most accidents are made by overcorrection. You drift a little bit into the right uh, ditch and then swerve back and you hit a car coming head on. Even while he's dead, you can feel his thumb in your side all the time telling you, wake up, wake up, wake up. No, 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 that comes this way, turn left this way. He believed that you had to be there pushing the edge out in front of you just a little bit all the time, all the time, and because it kept you alert, it kept you in, in the now, in the present. 
And his whole lecture from behind the wheel was about that. He used the car as, as a visual aid. Anything's feasible, pretty much, as long as you put your mind to it, put it together. I built all kinds of crazy stuff. Yeah, these are some of the bedrooms. These are full VWs trimmed at the wheel wells, so they're pretty much a full VW sitting on top. Well, we got them on top by putting a big heavy duty chain between two redwood trees and a huge pulley. Then it raised the vans off the ground, and we drove the bus underneath them, and then turned around and did the other one. Then we attach them to the top. Some people would say we're idiots because we chop VWs. But as we say, there's nothing better for a VW than on top of a Chevy. I feel like I'm opening their, their field of vision in a way by driving this thing around. It's like, hello, there's not just one way of living. There's many ways you guys need to get creative now. It's time for some change. I know where there's buses that are took people have been working on for like 11 years, and they are, they make this bus look like a shack because they are so like pristine woodwork, master woodworkers. And I don't have the book with me, but I had one back home at my my friend's house. It's a uh, Rolling Homes, and it's this beautiful book with me. some beautiful buses to like funky buses, funkier than this thing. Super funky there, just crazy how what things they just slap together. I would prescribe a network, a huge network of farms uh, to become havens where, where educational units and vil mobile villages that would tour around in, in old Conestogas and various, we'd get creative. Man, we wouldn't limit ourselves to any ideas. We'll, we'll do it all and it'll be fun. So my vision is a complete sweep of culture into something much more conducive for human, human spirit and mind and body. And I'm promoting that everywhere I go. Who am I? Yes. I have chosen to acknowledge the word freedom it's not just the word, it was, it was a relationship with an inner, inner process of mine. So I would say freedom is, is a word that reflects what I have been seeking all of my life. And freedom for me in that way represents a freedom from my fears, a freedom from uh, my attachments, a freedom from my addictions, a freedom from my passion, a freedom from my despair. It's, it's a freedom that implies an acceptance of nearly everything. Where my confusion comes in is when I start to have fears about the future. Um, I think that when I, lo when I let myself perceive of myself in classical, like, cultural terms, my fear, of course, is that I'm abandoned by my friends and family and left to be a wandering, insane whack. But, it doesn't take me long to get over that when I really just look at life and see how rich the moment is with opportunity. I'm who I am and I'll never be satisfied. <laughs> but that drives me and keeps me going, man. Are we cursed to the concrete course as we blindly find our way, distant from the source and shadowed by the day, mother nature slashed by destination's sword? Its moment ever barren is the just reward. So can the quest be for the question, why seek the abyss, while nature's sensuous song beckons us to bliss? I get along okay, I'm just trying to do the best I 
can living from day to day but living in this world today is like carrying a heavy load i feel just like a woodchuck in the road you know a woodchuck leads a simple life free of pain and strife gets up in the morning like you and me and kisses a woodchuck wife he has breakfast with the woodchuck kids you know the woodchuck job ain't far but crossing the road is an awful bitch when you don't know about cars I don't want poor people to be criminals just because they're poor. I don't want people who are so poor that have to live in their vehicles be criminalized for just merely trying to survive. This was for a, an expensive car commercial, but it spoke volumes to me of my favorite rant. Judge me by my actions, not my appearances. And that's why I wrote this down to remind people, perception is not always reality. I'm a bus fanatic. I love buses, and I, I really do. I've, I've loved them since I was a little kid, you know. And I've, I've built them. I've worked for bus companies, other bus companies. Uh, in Army Reserves is where I'm just getting back from. Uh, I just got back today this past weekend. I'm in Army Reserves. I teach transportation in Army Reserves. I'm an instructor there. I teach everything from Jeeps, a Humvee, right up to the M60 tank and all the trucks in the middle. So, yeah, transportation is my life. That's all I've ever done. <clears throat> I mean, I've done other things, you know what I mean, but that's that's what I'm the best at. I drive for Greyhound. Uh, that's too cool. That's what I love. That. Yeah. Greyhound. All my drivers, they're kind of envious of me, you know. They, he just guy he lives drives a bus and he lives in a bus, you know. <laughs> I mean, my son, you can ask my son, our last home was one of the most beautiful ranch homes you could ever imagine. I mean, we had a beautiful home. But uh, we sold it and got rid of it and now he's working out of town in Arizona and so, you know, it's just for me. They always ask me, why did I sell the ranch home? I said, well, because that way you can't move home. I mean, you know, I don't, I can't foresee myself right now in the future. I can't foresee myself leaving this lifestyle. Mm -hmm. I, I've all, you can ask my son. We've always wanted a bus. We've always wanted to kind of be living on the road, have that freedom to pull up stakes, go where we want, uh, unplug from PG&E or the electric company, you know, and have that freedom if you want it. You know, this here is, I mean, it's like, you know, a ton of bricks off your back. I mean, it's almost, until you're actually there and experience and live it, we can, uh, we can talk to everybody and, and uh, interview them, if you will, and, and find out, but live it. It makes a, it makes a big change in your life. Um, I miss my home. Don't misunderstand me. It was a beautiful place to be. Uh, there's a great feeling of security knowing that you got a little piece of the rock. And we're not talking prudential here, you know, but your little little niche in the world. Well, now I'll just travel all over it. <laughs> I'm not homeless. I have a home. My home is homeless, but not me. Oh, yes. Gather around the campfire. Dusty but serviceable. Same could be said about me. <laughs> oh, yes. They keep tearing down public housing and cheap housing and build more expensive housing and they never let the old tenants back in or if the ones that can get back in are, are hard pressed and soon lose it and there is no alternative there is no truly affordable housing so we banded together years ago 
in response to the fact that they are going to develop this area and they just took the street away from us. There were 80 to 100 vehicles living on China Basin Street when they threw up signs, no parking, 2 to 6 a.m. every night, which means you can't stay there. So people scattered out hither and thither and yon, and we've been playing the um, chase me, chase me game ever since. So we became a group. We officially named ourselves at the beginning of October the Vehicularly House Residents Association. We want to create a community. We want the good people to come in. We want the people that can't take care of themselves to be nurtured by the rest of the community. We want the people that have dropped through the cracks to have a stable base to climb back up the rungs if that's what they want. And to do that, you have to have a stable part of a population of people that just adore living like this. This is a housing emergency. They don't seem to understand it. They think it's a moral problem. We live like this because we want to live like this. Yes, some of us do. The other ones are out here because they can't afford to live any other way. You ask what would happen, what life would be like without my vehicle, and I told you impossible, because that would put me on the street with nothing with no place to go, with no toilet, with no food, with no place to even store a change of clothes. What a life. Is there any question in your mind as to which is the better way to live, like this or like that. Like I said, being crazy don't make you stupid. And I chose a better existence. Sure, I could drive away. I could go someplace where they don't have laws against living in their vehicle. I could have a nice life. I plan to. But. I don't want to leave this idea here that poverty is a criminal activity. One time Burroughs was talking about the thing Kennedy says, ask not what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do to your country. Burroughs says, what bullshit? He says, the government is supposed to be there to serve the people. Uh, and what bullshit it is to think that the people are there to serve the government. I got blasted pretty good in um, all metal hips, metal face, metal feet. I hit shot about 16 times, I think it was. I was long range recon, search and destroy and shit. Just murdering people, killing people, and you know, you see their faces. And sometimes I'd be dreaming, I'd be dreaming I'm fighting it. I'm in here wrestling around with myself, you know. You know I had two years of psychological rehabilitation. Yeah. And then they let me out on the street. Oh, I went home for a while, I got married, went and got my job back and all that bullshit. And after a while, it didn't work for her. She said she was too terrified and all that little shit. I think I hurt the kids, I don't hurt nobody. That's the ground she got her divorce on. She said I was insane, but I'm not insane. I was just having relapses. I don't have any more wives or any of that shit. A person like me won't have one. I'll probably die without one. Yeah. Because your life is too different. You don't know when. You, know. you can't really concentrate on another person, man. I'm living. You know I, mean? I got my son this morning to handle. You know. And he's young now. And by the time he gets 13 to 14 with the way he is, it's going to be a real handful. You know, <laughs> you know what I mean? So I really ain't going to have the time for it. 
You know, I've tried different women to help, but that don't do it. He's raised his way, you know, free spirit. They want to do all these things that their mother done to him. It, it don't work. You know, he's living better than most kids. He's free. Come on, get up here, man. Yeah, but you can't be back there. Come on, you know, doors might fly open or something. You know, it'll spill you out on the street. Discipline, I don't mind. But trying to guide him into something, you let him be. You know, that's why he's got a brain. But I think my boy's gonna want to do whatever he wants to do, and he don't want to be even bothered by me. You know what I mean? It's the way it is. I guess that's the way it was with my dad. Pretty smart, according to the school. That's why he goes to school to learn your system of things, so he can know whether he want to live in it. I didn't want to live in it. You know, what I mean? he may not want to either. He might want to maintain his freedom, and to do that, you got to do what we're doing now. Most people get out here first time; they're really hard. You know what I mean? They start taking, but then they realize taken from here means I can't survive nowhere. Then they stop. Everybody's sharing it. Enough for everybody. I never run out of it. I feed anybody who comes along in my van. They just ready to eat. And I'm never out of food. And in months I don't have money at a time. You know I mean? Where'd you get that chicken, David? I got it. I, I got it from my van. Who, who made it for you? My dad. The, uh, the job of society is to embrace. Uh, once you have a society that keeps separate, you know, whether it's holding gay guys off or whether it's holding black people off or whether it's holding uh, dope fiends off, that's, it's the same thing. With that, we get back to the, the real problem. How can we be more accepting of each other's lives? You know, think of the people that we've lost in the last few years. Uh, what a privilege it's been just to be in the same world with them. Off at last, Charlie. This is the engine room conducting the sound room. I'd like to be put in direct communication with the pilot. Pilot. Oh, this is the captain speaking. We have a direct line to the pilot for some emergency information to drink. Yes. Yes. Are you there? I am there. Are you there, Jay? Uh oh, we've lost him. I can hear me. I you lost. I can hear me. Frederick's when we won't worry about him. I go by the name of Rom Tom. R O M T O M stands for. It's short for Romany Tom, Gypsy Tom. Been on the road for 30 years. The last time I rented a regular house was November 1968. A lot of years I've been living on the road, not always in vehicles, sometimes just in a pup tent in the early days. Bicycled coast to coast, bicycled from Mexico to Canada with Ellie. Okay, so, well, uh, this is my Ellie. Been with her for 22 years. Ellie, they want to come and look inside, so can you make room so they yeah, can come inside? It's good in the, okay, the Ellie. Okay, well, Ellie. Down there, it's down there. There's so. too much room in here, and you, it's easy to bang your head. Let's see if I can turn on a light. It's not like uh, most big buses where there's lots of room. Come on in. Ellie's hard to understand. She's French. And all the life on the road and a lot of the havoc and the drama and the travail has been overwhelming to her. She has a mental problem now where when she talks, nobody can understand her. And a lot of times, 
I don't understand her. No, 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 I, I was with the Pompey for the fire. When they started, the, when the Alam de Matches took, okay? Okay. Uh, and I've been with her 22 years. She just talks in circles, but I love her. I've been with her 22 years. You gonna go sit in the keystone for a little bit? No, give me a dollar. I'll go okay, sit there. I'll go just 50 cents. I'm sure I tell me they took in fire a year ago. But, um, you got some change and there's a dollar. A David piece, okay. Now thanks. you go sit in the keystone and have a cup of coffee. You know, the, you'd think a bus, bus this big would have lots of room inside. I once had a huge bus. My first bicycle bus was a Volkswagen bus in 1982. And then I got a 41 International. And then I had a Bluebird. And this is the third one. It's a 74 Ford. This is uh, where I work on bikes. I'll show you this. See, uh, my rack goes here. And wherever I am, wherever I am, I just the clamp clamps the bike and then I, I can work on it. The way I make my money when I'm doing it is I drive this thing out near the college and I park on the side streets where it's two hour parking. I have to move it every two hours. But in that two hours, students find me and they have me repair bikes for them. And uh, they bring, they buy bikes. And so I buy them for five bucks, 10 bucks. And I go to Goodwill, Salvation Army. I usually get them for less than $10 and they need lots of work. And then I rebuild them when the weather's warm and I feel like working on them. Lately I've been doing other things, working on my writing and working on my photography. And this is, uh, this is, I do photography. This is Esther, famous crone from the rainbow. She's 70 years old and uh, one of the most wonderful human beings. I do nude photography and she's a good friend of mine. I only photograph my friends. I only photograph sisters, so to speak. And, and I have poetry that goes with each one of them. Yeah, I wrote the poetry, poetry for each one of them. Can you pick one out? Okay, let's see. Let's see. I think 11 is a good one. Can you see that picture of Varda? Yeah. Can you see that? Wow. Okay. That's uh, incredible. I'll read you the poem. Varda arrives on s silver moons amidst quintzillion colors of the dawn. Her toes stretch forth to feel the river. Her heart reaches forth into the one. Birth is heart of the universe. Varda is given birth to a son. The river talks with ripples and laps, and river birds dance on velvet winds, and fishes flicker silver in the glittering waters run. Her feminine breath will join dew-scented air. Her heart give words to poems of God. In the image of all universes, dancing, praying, unclothed, unshod, creation is a mother's care. She is a sprite of always rivers, one spark of suns who flies forever to their harmony and blends the green, brown, blue threads of river windings to the colors of the dawn. If I were a being sixty galaxies tall, she'd be what I'd gaze upon. And her sister heart would make me happy were she to call. I would run through tall grasses like a wild puppy and lend cold nose to chakra songs. If I were a being sixty galaxies tall, I would hold this river in my heart. And she who dances and prays upon the shore, I would anxiously await. And if she was late, at last her name I would call. With winds for voice, with birds flight, I would write her name on azure skies and look carefully to see if she would notice me. I see it to be the first art 500,000 years ago, that's half a million years ago, the very first art the human race ever created was a, that we found in archaeology is a pair of breasts sculpted out of flint. Half a million years old. I'm not creating a new form of art. I'm creating the most ancient form of art the world has ever known. In this town, they talk about my photography. They, they don't know. They, a lot of people presume. They've heard rumors that all I do is photograph children or some such things. You know, they think it's a sexual thing. Anytime a woman's nude, you know, they think it's a sexual thing. They can't imagine. They're not artists themselves. They don't know what it's like to be working with a model in the nude. They presume you're, you're having a sexual 
adventure. This is one of my best known photographs. One of these women's is, women is a Palestinian Muslim. You can do anything. You can photograph anything. In the beginning, all things were created good. I photographed many at a time. Two beautiful sisters that were making love together, or touching each other, or kissing each other. That's not pornography to me. Nobody's giving them money. Other people might photograph something called fucking or, or uh, just sex. Two people who don't know each other and don't even care about each other, maybe even hate each other, but they're willing to do it to make money. I've heard of that happening. I, I think that that's pornography. A lot of lesbian women who don't like men at all, like this woman here. Very strong-minded lesbian woman. You can tell by her eyes. These women are strong. These women are so tough as nails. They're the kind of woman that if a man exploited women, these are the women he'd have nightmares about strangling him, you know. And these women who hate the exploitation of women, they know that I photograph women who appreciate and respect my art and they totally trust me and what I'm doing, that I'm a brother to them. That's what I try to be with all my heart. When I pray between me and my God, those are the things that are in my heart. These are the things I'm doing and my heart is part of my art. For people like us, we have just so much amount of capital. A little bit of capital comes into your life if you have to give it to that millionaire for this place so that you have a sofa, so that you can sit on a sofa and spend your life there looking at nothing because you can't afford to buy nothing, not even a book. That happens to so many people. So they end up saying, if I did have any money, I'd buy a good book and read it, you know. If I did have any money, I'd buy a Volkswagen bus and I'd go somewhere, but I can't because i got to give all my money to this millionaire who owns all these rental properties so that I can have a sofa to sit on you know, somewhere where there's not going to be any rain falling on me. Well, those people that said, fuck that, and said, what I want to do, instead of giving my money to a millionaire, I want to spend it on books and get an umbrella to keep the rain off, and I'll live out in a ditch instead with my book. After a while, they have a lot of creativity in their life. Oh, man, I feel, my life is so full. And they can't imagine ever going back to having a sofa and nothing else. <laughs> then you've got something in your life. It's so much more than a sofa, you know. <laughs> Most of your rubber traps barter and trade if it's possible, because money is really not what they got, you know. How much? Your coat, so? 20 bucks. 20? Better quality God, shirt. <laughs> since last year, dude. You got it all. That's how come I do art. I can't have kids. I can't have kids because my mother took DES, fertility pills, which made me infertile. So I believe my pottery is like my children, and I make these, and people pay me for them, and they're all over the world. And I've done that in under three years. Mugs is my money maker, or it's my own, my first line of stuff, and it's just successful enough. My knowledge came from my father's and father's father and here in America. It's the turquoise and crystal and quartz and it's a jewelry making thing. That's about 6,000 bucks. See, because everything's weaved like a spider. Little strands of gold, little strands of white gold. As you get civilized, they call it collective bargaining and shit like that, but it's just fucking horse trade. I'll give you this for that. <laughs> And when both sides are satisfied, the deal's done. See, they, they, these books, they can't recycle them because of the glue in them. It clogs up the machine. So they just throw them away. So I ask people to bring them here, because books are so expensive. So I put the books out, turn the books in for people to get it, and then put the money in and I buy the food with it. See, it's recycled. So when I go to the grocery store, I didn't think about just I buy a can of beans. I buy a big bag of beans. You know, because I'm cooking for my friends and me.
to make peace now. You know, because everybody's tired of killing their own people. Because when you ball right down to it, I used to, you know, I used to, a long time ago, I used to say, oh man, I can't, I don't like white people. And we used to say stupid stuff, like we learned that stuff, you know what I mean? So you don't know who you, you don't know what who you, you be talking about your own people. Can't go wrong, it's hard to fall off the path when you're trying so hard to be on the path. There's a lot of people that aren't really on any path. They change with every cold wind or whatever the political climate is, you know. Me, I'm on a path and I have to be on this path and I can't fall off this path because my feet aren't even walking on the ground, they're walking on air, you know. I'm very fortunate. Some people love mountains and they photograph mountains cloud formations, whatever. I photographed beautiful, beautiful women between 18 and 70 years old. <laughs> That's my limits. I often tell people, Further's probably the most famous hippie bus in the world, but the bicycle bus is probably the second most famous hippie bus in the world. Somebody asked Leary about the other bus. He said, is this the real bus? And Leary says, was it ever the real bus? <laughs> If there's nothing else that it, we've learned from the whole psychedelic culture, it's this, is that there's room. There's room for all the different kind of thoughts that we have. There's room. Until finally you realize, shit, everything exists. This is it. It all exists. It doesn't last, but it exists. That train that we're hearing come. And the, and the blackbird down there we're hearing, it exists. And your, your mind stretches out to feel in all of these things, bring them home to you. But it's like, again, it's not like you're having them. It's like you're part of them. You, you live with them. Anybody who's ever watched birds knows that the bird knows something you don't, and you know something the bird doesn't. And ever so often, you will match. The bird will look at you and you'll cease to be a human. And you'll, and the bird will cease to be a bird. The consciousnesses will blend together. And that's what all of this vehicle stuff is about. This is Fredrickson in the engine room. This is Fredrickson in the engine room. Everything seems to be running smooth. Red, 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 You guys got good boots. We'll drive in and I'll show you the original bus. And so we're a threat. The people living in their uh, rigs, they're a threat to society because um, they make society feel ill at ease. And, and they're right. We are a threat to that society because we believe in a better society. This is the original bus? Uh-huh. This is the captain speaking. So this bus has been down here since Woodstock, uh, biodegrading nicely. It means a kind of um, freedom, not in that you're free to drive around, but you're, you're free to feel this way about this bus. Hey, yo, I just come up with a jump for you. What I want you to do is to fill up one of those pipes down there and bring it up here on fire. We're tremendously lucky to be around right now. These people that are off the wall, these bodhisattvas that are out there living in their old Buicks, uh, smoking a little homegrown dope, trying to teach their kids, they're not gonna bomb Bosnia. You know, if we wanna know what to do with uh, 
Bosnia. Take 80 bucks worth of LSD and just sp spray it over everything. Let them work it out. You know, it, but everybody says, oh no, you can't do that. That's, that's inhuman. Much better to kill them. I choose this, this is freedom. <laughs> but it's my life, dude. It's his life. Huh? Living out here on the road, man. It's your life. It's my life. It's much people's life. Man. The rubber trams, man. Yeah. That's what it is. Yeah. That's because there used to be everybody rode a train. Well, the trains yeah, ain't worth fucking riding anymore. Yeah, that's what we call hobos when we have cars. Yeah. Well, we're rubber tramps because we got rubber ride. and we can roll down the yeah, asphalt. You a rubber tire tramp. And change my whole yard. And I think my boy's gonna. You get smart enough to have whatever he wants. You know, what I mean? you know, to get what he wants without hurting another person for it, or stepping on somebody, or making somebody else live miserable because he's got to have it. I don't want that. I want him to be able, smart enough to have it without doing that. And I believe he can have it a lot faster by sharing it with a lot more others. That's what you're supposed to do. That's the way it's supposed to be. This is where it really comes down to it. Is there are certain people that want to limit consciousness and certain people who want to expand consciousness. The people that want to limit it, uh, they want to have a gun because there's nothing that limits consciousness as well as a gun. You shoot somebody's consciousness goes away real quick. Once we start accepting each other, then you open the door. Then the Easter rabbit comes in. Next thing, you've got S. Clay Wilson. Next thing you know, you got the hell of angels. <laughs> I have a lot of things to do. I'm very busy doing the things I need to do. My writing and my photography, is, uh, I think it's not important just to me. I think, I mean, these books might not get published till after I'm dead. Uh, it might be the only way. I'm, I'm, I don't have enough time to spend publishing them, to go in and around to publishers. I'm too busy writing them. I'm too busy working on them. Somebody else someday will do that. And uh, then I think these things will be important down the line. Sometimes it may look bad, but the, the, the negative experiences have depth to them. The happiness stuff is on the surface. That's the top of the mountain. You can go to the top of the mountain, but who can stay on the top of the mountain? Most of this stuff is in the valley. Yeah, the old saying, we've all heard it, you know, you, you don't judge a book by its cover, because you never know what's underneath those pages. You know, uh, you never know who people really are or what they're all about. And we look at the homeless person um, as if they're nobody, they're downtrodden, they're bums, they're whatever. Um, not to become uh, religiously speaking, but you never know when you're you're feeding an angel. In so much as I want to change society, I want to change society's uh, handling of their perceptions. We, every one of us as a traveler is a different person. Some of us are traveling to run away from something. Some of us are traveling to find something. It's all kind of the same thing, but but it was a different uh, purpose. Some of us have conviction about our lives, some don't. And therefore our lifestyles differ. And so when the, when the culture looks at all of us as one thing, as though we all are represented by one archetype of homeless person or something, then I feel I'm being, I'm being basically judged before I'm being considered. So I, I would only ask that people give me the chance. Bob, what I had for lunch today? What's today? The second of February. Today's February. We had cheeseburgers with ketchup, and mustard, pickles, and a salad bar. Chocolate chip cookie and milk. <laughs> yeah. That—that's what I had for lunch today. Yeah, I know. I had for lunch today. Okay, get out of my way. Star Trek's hey, on. We'll be done with it. There are two different ladders. One of the ladders is straight old Judeo-Christian ladder with uh, Charlton Heston at the top of it with a big beard and everybody's trying to climb this ladder and kiss God's ass and always the people to blame are these people down there living in their Buick. 
Uh, whereas over here, there's this other, other ladder, and, it, and it's all wiggly and uh, taped together, and Dr. Seuss-looking ladder going up to the clouds, and you don't, don't know where it's going. But everybody that's on this ladder knows that they're not on that ladder. We, we aspire to different things. And this is our salvation, is that we don't know where we're going. These other people are certain where they're going and they'll never get there. We don't know where we're going, so we don't know when we're not there. <laughs> but I know this, that everybody, to, if they're going to be mature, they have to have a run. They have to make a run outside of their uh, little family circle. And they have to go somewhere and do something. Then they can come back and they're whole. Um, if you don't sow a few wild oats, you don't raise any oats. His dream, my dream, our dream, I think it was one dream that we dreamed one afternoon, you know, and a pretty good one. I mean, you know, the sky was yellow and the sun was blue. What's up with that? You know? <laughs> you know, I'm not an activist. I mean, that's what you mean anymore. I, I, I'm too old for that. I, I'm a catalyst. You know what a catalyst is? Yeah, that's something that lays around and does nothing until it's added to the other ingredients. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Everybody should have the experience of uh, digging a hole and doing it outdoors because the angle you're at is different, see? And I think a lot of people get colon cancer and all those things because they're sitting at the wrong angle on a seat. And to sit on a pink toilet is not really what a man should do anyway. Like the other day I went into a store. Where, which store was that? It was some store and, uh, and I bought something. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> The lady was figuring out my bill, and uh, and I said, "Don't forget my 10% discount for being a '60s hippie." No, I'm I'm a Republican. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought she'd say, "Right" or some such thing, and she said, oh, "I almost forgot." Plunk, 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 plunk. She just put it right into the catch register, 10% off. She said, I'm sorry, I just almost forgot that. Far out! <laughs> it is something earthy. And, and you smell the, the earth and the mixture of your, of your shit in the ground and it kind of wafts up. And even though it smells not, not quite pleasant, it still smells better than in the toilet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You got you got several different classes of people. You got the oh my god and they got to come on, okay. Then you got the ones that are astounded. Then you got the ones that are astounded and believe they didn't see it, okay. And then you got the ones that like refuse to see it with the blinders. They just like no dinner. And then you got the ones that drop to their knees and go chinga to madra. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's better to do it in the earth, and it feels better. You feel it, there's something in your gut that feels better after a good shit in the ground that you don't get in a flush toilet or in a public restroom. You know what? Why don't you just go about your daily routine? No! <laughs> <laughs> You know what? <laughs> 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 you know what? It's like my stew. With every color you can think to short of blue. And it'd be damn easy to hate us if we all was just a 
date is it variety that makes us fun to chew said it's variety that makes us fun to chew yeah it's variety that makes us fun to chew